Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'm working on these two storm responder generators. Uh, these actually don't belong to me. Uh, the one on the left was dropped off by a subscriber and the one on the right by Jason. I've bought a lot of things from him over the years and he's also dropped off quite a few recently. Now this one Jason found on Facebook Marketplace. It was free and for good reason. The prior owner said it was running the engine stopped and since then the engine has not rotated it is stuck solid so you know I've already checked the oil there is none in there so this engine is most likely done and this one over here this actually belongs to a local subscriber who was running it a few years ago when he had an issue it stopped he tried restarting it and it hasn't started since and after pulling it over I can see why there is absolutely no compression. That connecting rod is blown for sure. So we've got two otherwise good generators with no power plant. Uh, luckily, I did rebuild one of these engines recently and that one I've already promised to Jason. So I'm gonna start there. We'll do a quick engine swap, get this one up and running. And as far as this generator goes, my hope is that between these two engines we can piece one together plus a few parts and get that one running again as well so let me get you set up a little bit better and get going on this So I think this will be a pretty quick swap here. I am gonna start just by pulling the tank and the heat shield to give better access to what we need. You know, normally I would pull everything attached to the engine. You know, in this case, I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna leave most things in place. Really the only thing we have to get off of the engine is the power head. So the wires, they need to be disconnected from the control panel the stator removed, as well as the rotor and the bell housing. And at that point, we can lift this engine out and put a good working engine in its place. Just gonna get the fuel line disconnected from the carb so we can lift that tank out of there. And to get the heat shield off, there's just two bolts in each corner and a couple down on the bottom rail, and this will just lift out of here. This shield it's slotted down here, so you don't need to remove these bolts completely. Just need to be loosened up. While we're here, we'll just get the wires unplugged. You know, most generators don't have a quick disconnect like this, in which case the wires just have to be disconnected from the terminal block. Down below, in this case, we can leave those wires there. It's not gonna cause a problem sliding that stator off. And now we have the access we need to the power head. So the next move here is to get this uninstalled. And in order to do that, we need to pull this end cover. This generator has an AVR. It also has a set of brushes. And those things are kind of in the way because most likely we are gonna need a puller to separate the ball bearing from the end housing. Not to mention the brushes, you don't wanna leave them in there when sliding the stator out because you will break those brushes. So 
we'll get the cover off, get that stuff out of the way. And before we can use the puller to get the stator off, we do also need to detach the end housing from the frame rail. And there is a zip tie here holding this connector together. More importantly, it holds it away from the rotating rotor. You don't want these wires loose because they can and will get sucked in. So we'll disconnect the wires from the brushes. The red goes on the left. That's the positive. And to get the brushes out, it's just one bolt right here. There isn't one on the other side. Instead, there's just a little bump in the aluminum that's used as a locator to hold those brushes in place. I think that's it. You know, these wires, they will just come off with the stator. Uh, there is actually one wire connected down to the frame rail. You can't see it right now, so let's get that disconnected. We'll get these two nuts off to free this up. And then we should be ready to pull these four bolts going around, which will allow the stator to come out. And that's the wire I'm talking about right there. I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten about it. And you go to pull the stator off and it's anchored to the frame. And these insulators, you should get them out of the way. These are just threaded into the end housing. And if they're in there, what happens is that you have to actually lift the stator up quite a bit to clear the screw that's still there attached to the insulator going down through. And there's not a lot of clearance up above. There's only about an inch and it makes it really tight to get it out. So I'm just going to use a piece of wood kind of as leverage to get this up. We'll spin these out and just get them out of the way. And I just grabbed another piece of wood and put it right here. So now it's supporting essentially this whole side of the machine. You know, this stator, it's now kind of hovering and in the perfect position to come out. We have clearance on the bottom right there and plenty of clearance on the top. So let's get the four bolts out. You know, if we're lucky, this will just slide off. Uh, most likely though, we're gonna need a puller in which case we should actually loosen this wire block. Just remove these bolts so we can hook in there with the puller. Uh, just being sure not to hook in right there where the brushes were. The aluminum, you know, it's cut out for the brushes. It's not as strong. So you don't want to pull in that spot or you will certainly break the end housing. see if we get lucky on this one. I would say that's a no. We need the puller.
I'm using a very small wrench on this. And these end housings, they break very easily. It doesn't take much. And this one's not budging at all. Oh. Might have just moved. Yeah, it's coming out. If you find it's not coming out, just stop turning. You know, use like a rubber mallet. Just hit around here. Spray some PB Blaster in by the ball bearing. You know, you don't want to force it because you will break the end housing. And we're in. We just got the rotor left. That's the last big obstacle here. And these can be tricky to take off, especially on the storm responders, like an older model one like this. Now, that said, this power head, it's actually kind of rare on this machine. Usually, they don't have an AVR. They are the older style that just has a bridge rectifier, like this one right here. These are very robust, but without an AVR, the voltage is high without a load, and it's low under a load. And these rotors are not threaded. So when you remove the bolt, there's really no way to get the rotor off without making threads or using some other method. So this one, because it's a clone type power head with an AVR, I'm expecting there's going to be some threads under there. Usually it's an M12, 1.75, and if that's the case, it'll make getting this rotor off fairly easy, I hope. Good, we've got threads. This is an M12, 1.75. Threads are pretty deep, which is a good thing, although a bit sloppy, so there is a chance it could strip out. But I'd say we got a good three quarters of an inch of threads. So what I'm going to do is put the rotor bolt back in until it hits the crankshaft and just mark where that is. And I do have some bolts here that are larger in diameter than this bolt. So when it goes down and pushes against the crankshaft, it's not gonna damage the threads. And I've already got some cut up from other projects. And what I want is a rod that is actually about a third of an inch less than where I made that mark. So this one is too long. Let's just grab some of these others. That one actually looks pretty good. So we'll set that aside. That one's too short. Let's see what this one looks like. And this one might work as well. It looks a little short. So let's start with this one here. And what you want to be careful of here is, well, stripping the threads, but also mushrooming that rod. So if you get it stuck there in the shaft, then you get a problem. Yeah, in this case, I actually don't think I'm going to use that one. I can only engage maybe a thread or two. And it's very sloppy. So I think I'm going to use the slightly shorter rod. That'll let me get a lot better thread engagement and hopefully leave enough that I can push just enough to push that rod into the crankshaft, pulling that rotor out of there. So that's the shorter rod. It's about a half inch in. Yeah, 
and that's still fine. We have at least a quarter inch. We can drive this bolt in before the threads bottom out. So let's hit that with the impact and see if that rotor comes off. That was easy. Well, that came out surprisingly easy. So we're just about in the home stretch, I would say. We just need to get this backing plate off. There's a bolt on each side. And then four bolts hold that bell housing to the engine. And usually it's Loctited in. You know, in this case, I see lock washers. So I don't think we're going to need to apply any heat to get those bolts to come out. All right, let's see if this comes off. The extension... It absorbs a lot of the impact, so it makes it less effective, but let's give it a try. There we go. So out of curiosity, let's pull the drain bolt. See if there's any oil in here at all. A little bit. Yeah, there's not a lot of oil that came out of that engine. There should have been about a quart if it was full, and we are far from that. That said, this is a lot of oil for a blown up engine that ran out of oil. Usually I don't get half that. So that gives me hope that maybe the internals aren't too bad. You know, the fact that the engine doesn't rotate in either direction is actually a good sign too. It tells me the connecting rod most likely is still connected. And if it had blown, it sends shrapnel throughout the engine, usually punching a hole in the block right here and damaging other components. So my hope is it's still connected and the damage inside is minimal. Anyway, the plan was to unbolt this, set it aside, put the engine in that I've already rebuilt. And I think that still is the plan. But before I do that, it's gonna be easier just to peel the layers off this engine while it's still bolted down to the frame. So I'm gonna do that, you know, potentially we'll put a wrench on the crankshaft, see if we can get that rotating and move on. This is an E3 torque socket. Without it, it's kind of hard to remove this carb. Because you actually have to take these studs out.
just need to unplug these wires to get this fully off the machine. You know what, let's get the spark plug out. I wanna spray some WD-40 in there, see if we can't break this engine free. And if it does break free, I'm still gonna take it apart. I'm sure there's some serious damage in there. You know, I'm just hoping that the engine will rotate so that when we do take it apart, it'll make things a lot easier if the components aren't seized in there. Let's see if this thing's going to move. I'm going to try to back it up which is counterclockwise. <laughs> nope. not moving. How about forwards? Whoa. I think it moved. Doesn't sound too healthy. does move <laughs> and it has compression amazing yeah the engine rotates quite well and we have compression you know I held my thumb over the spark plug hole the compression pushed it off so that's a good sign it tells me the valves are good the pistons good obviously it's going up and down and most likely the camshaft is good. Now, that noise, it's not a good noise. That's definitely a knock. You know, I would say the connecting rod where it connects to the crankshaft is going to be the problem here. Uh, but the fact that we have what we have is a very good sign. So I'm going to, I guess, remove a few more things here before getting this off the frame. I'm going to get the coil off, probably pull the flywheel and get that exhaust off as well. Gonna use a puller to get the flywheel off.
Well, we've come this far. Let's keep going. That's crazy. I don't know if that noise is coming through, but I can feel the noise on the connecting rod. It's definitely the connecting rod on the big end. Very loose on the crankshaft. Anyway, let's rotate this around. It doesn't look half bad. I do see the original cross hatch on the sides. Bottom, there, there is a bit of discoloration, but nothing deep, nothing that I can feel. And same on the top. Let me get in there and show you. On the right side's very clean. On the bottom, you can see some white scratches there. You know, nothing deep, so I think that'll clean up quite well. And if I move over here, you can see the left side also very clean. The top side has a bunch of shallow scratches. Again, nothing deep. So I think with a quick hone, this cylinder should clean up okay. You know, as far as the head goes, no surprises there. Just a bit of carbon that needs to be cleaned off and I think we'll be good. So let's finally get this engine off the frame. We'll get the bolts out, get it opened up and take a closer look at what happened inside. Yeah, there it is. Definitely the connecting rod. 
So keep a close eye on the connecting rod and the crankshaft. I'm gonna rock the crank back and forth. And you can see there's a ton of clearance between those two parts. So that is the noise we were hearing. I'm sure that's why the engine was locked up. You know, ideally, the clearance should be only about two or three thousandths of an inch, and we are way past that point. So let's get the bolts out of the cap. That'll let us get the piston and the connecting rod out of the engine, as well as the rest of these parts, and then we can fully size up the extent of the damage. Wow, that one's already loose. So is that one. These are way under torqued. So I'm guessing just the heat from the lack of oil stretched these bolts and that's why they're so loose you know it's not like they were turned out or anything they just weren't much more than finger tight Cap won't let go. There we go. Piston actually doesn't look too bad. You know, I think we can reuse it. Uh, the camshaft visually looks to be in good shape. We'll measure that up in a bit. And the crankshaft, it's not too bad. I mean, the main journal does have some aluminum transfer, but I've seen far worse clean up and measure up like new. So I'm optimistic that that will be the case on this one. And the cylinder, we can now see all the way to the bottom. You know, no surprises there, just more of the same. And of course, the crankcase, it's in very good shape. You know, since that connecting rod didn't let go, nothing in here was damaged. So the two wild cards really are the cylinder and this journal. So we need to clean both of those up, take some measurements, make sure they are usable. And if they are, we'll place an order for some parts. So I'm going to give this a quick 30 second hone and we'll check, see what those scratches look like.
I ended up honing it for another 30 seconds, so a minute in total, and it cleaned up pretty well. You know, it's not perfect, although all the marks on the top are gone, and on the bottom, if you look real hard, you can see traces of the marks of the scratches that were there, but it can't be felt. So I think that's good enough. I'm not going to push my luck. I don't want to take off too much material. I'm going to measure this up real quick, make sure we have enough meat left and that we're not out of round. I've calibrated this board gauge to 3.3 inches and I'm going to start by checking from left to right. That is the area of least amount of wear. I'm not expecting to see an issue there, although you never know. Anyway, we're allowed four thousandths up to four thousandths of wear. And in this case, we have pretty much no wear at the top. None in the middle. And virtually none on the bottom. So that is a good thing. Now we'll check top to bottom. That is where we're most likely to see a problem. You know, again, we can't have more than four thousandths of wear or one and a half thousandths out around. That looks pretty good. Maybe half a thousandth on the top. Same in the middle. And the same on the bottom. So this cylinder is actually in pretty good shape. Minimal wear and it's not out around. So I think we're going to be fine here. Let's turn our attention to that crankshaft. I'm going to use muriatic acid to eat this aluminum off the crank. It's very effective. It's very strong stuff. So take proper precautions. Make sure you wear gloves and glasses. And you're going to also need some baking soda to neutralize the acid when you're done. So what I normally do is just cut up a piece of cloth and wrap it around the journal. Let it sit for about 10 minutes, swap it out, repeat that a few times until the aluminum's gone. All right, we're at the 10 minute mark. Let's see how we're making out. Seems to be making pretty quick work of the aluminum. It's turning pretty dark. There's still a couple chunks right there. So we'll give it another 10 minutes or so and see how we make out. It looks like those chunks are gone. And what's left, it's rubbing off pretty easily. So, do I hit it with some 800 grit or do I give it a little more acid? I think we'll give it maybe 10 more minutes. It's been another 10 minutes, 30 minutes in total. So I think this should be enough. So I'm just gonna pull this off. We'll neutralize the acid that's on there and switch gears to polishing. For this, I'm just going to use some WD-40, and we'll start with some 800 grit. We'll do that a couple times, move up to 1500, and finally 3000.
cleaning up pretty well. I think I'll hit it one more time with the 800 before moving up to the 15. Looking pretty good. It came out really nice. Nice mirror finish. So let's take a couple measurements and see if this is viable. I'm gonna start just by checking from left to right. Standard size is 1.2485. We're at 1.2475. So about a thousandth of wear from side to side. That's usually not where the issue is. It's usually top to bottom. Now, according to the manual, a thousandth is all we're allowed. According to another Briggs document, we're allowed two thousandths of wear. And this one we're at 1.2471. So we're four ten thousandths below what the service manual says, and we're above what the check chart says. So yeah, you know, it would be nice if these documents agreed with each other. And I think what it comes down to is that the connecting rod is allowed two thousandths of wear, and we're going to have a new connecting rod. So when you factor that in, we should be fine at 1.4 thousandths of wear with a new connecting rod. So I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to take a series of measurements on the side as well as the top, and I'll let you know the results. And the results are in. And the numbers, they look very consistent with what we just measured throughout. You know, starting from left to right on the flywheel side, we had 1.2475. And same with the center. And on the PTO side, we had two ten thousandths extra material. And from top to bottom, flywheel side, we had 1.2471. Same with the center. And on the PTO side, we had one ten thousandth extra material. And I double checked the journals here. They come in at the standard size, double check the lobes in these journals here on the camshaft, and they also come in at the standard size. So no appreciable wear on those items. So, you know, given the discrepancy here, you know, I actually think we're going to be okay because even if you take the lower of the two, which is the service manual, it allows for one thousandth of wear on that crankshaft and two thousandths on the connecting rod. So a total of three thousandths wear between those two parts. And with a new connecting rod, with this crankshaft, we're only gonna be at 1.4 thousandths. So we're not even halfway there, according to the service manual. And if you look at the check chart, we have an extra thousandth to play with. So I have no reservation in ordering the parts. I think this is gonna be a rebuildable engine. So I'm gonna place that order and while waiting for those parts to show up, we'll prep the block and get it ready for reassembly.
So cleaning the block, it is slow going. It does take a couple hours to do it right. Obviously, I'm not going to show you all of it, but I want to show some highlights. And cleaning the gaskets off, it's really, I wouldn't say a difficult task, but it is a tedious task. And I find razor blades do work best. You do need to be careful, though. Blades cut aluminum very easily. So you got to keep the blade shallow. Try not to dig in. And in my case, I use utility knife blades because they are thicker and they seem to be more durable. Now, you do have to switch out blades quite a bit. I mean, I've already gone through about four blades. You know, this is my fourth one right here. And once they start to get dull, they're not as effective and you're more likely to dig in and cause a problem. So like that, just getting the chunks off. And that'll come in with the 3M plastic Rolock bristle brush, which does a good job. That was actually made for prepping heads for automobiles. And GM used it for a while. They actually don't recommend it anymore. They found at least on cars, it can scratch the aluminum. So right there, I did put a little scratch. So I'm just going to stop. You know, I got all the heavy material off. We'll just use that bristle brush to finish the job. So let's check the end gap on these rings, see if they have any wear. Now this is the middle ring, and according to the service manual, the middle ring should have between 8 and 16 thousandths end gap as the standard size, and the reject size is 30 thousandths. So let's start at 16, which is the higher side of the standard size, and if it's in there really loose. So we do have some wear. Let's try a 21. Yeah, no problem, fits in there. And the largest feeler gauge I have is a 24. And it fits in there. So yeah, we're quickly approaching the reject size and uh, I think we're gonna be really close. So let's try Maybe the 24 plus, you know, a lower number like a three, which is this one right here. So if this fits, it would be 27 thousandths. And yeah, it fits. So we're right up against the reject size on this middle ring, and I'm sure the others aren't far behind. And at $50 for a new set of rings, or about 30 bucks more, you get a new piston and rings. You know, I think that's what I'm gonna do here. Just double checking the wrist pin, make sure there's no slop on this bad connecting rod. And it's actually pretty tight. So I don't think the wrist pin is worn out, but I do wanna get the sir clip out, slide the wrist pin out, make sure it's not damaged in some way.
Let's double check the wrist pin. I think it'll be okay because it came out without issue. Uh, the standard size is 0.6722. And that's exactly where we're at. Let's check the other side. Perfect, 0.6722. So the wrist pin's good. And last but not least, we gotta clean up the head and I'm also gonna clean up the valves and lap them in. Now, I'm always kind of hesitant to do this. It's one of those things that if this engine hadn't run out of oil, chances are the valves would have lasted a very long time without needing any maintenance like I'm about to do. But since we have it apart, might as well do it right. So to clean these valves up, I just spin it in a drill, hold a piece of scotch Bright to it with some WD-40. Makes quick work of it. Valve came out pretty well, and the head cleaned up nice as well. So one final test I like to do before putting things back together is just drop the valve in, push down lightly, and try to spin it. You shouldn't be able to spin that valve. If you can, then something isn't right. You know, in this case, the valve does not spin, 
So that tells me we're making pretty good contact all the way around. Anyway, let's do the same for the intake. The intake cleaned up especially well too with the scotch Bright. Looks brand new. Makes me wonder how many hours this machine had on it before it blew up. And some people ask, why do I tap it? Why do I stop and go like that? If you listen, hear how it smooths out. There's not much grinding compound left in there. So when you lift it up, it actually sucks a little bit back in on the valve face. Now you can hear it's grinding better and smoothing out again. So you tap it and you hear the change of the sound. Should be good enough. These valves were really not in bad shape. So they probably didn't need to be lapped. But it can't hurt. Just putting a bit of assembly lube back on that valve. If you don't have any, oil is fine. You know, in my case, I had pretty much washed off all the oil that was on there. So you want to make sure you have something on there. So to get this back together, it's basically the same process, but in reverse. And I think the biggest difference here is that the keepers are easier to get out than put back in you know and in this case you know use a bit of grease to kind of help them stick in place until they get locked where they should be and just take note the tapered part of the keeper goes down thicker part goes up so I'm just going to scoop a bit of grease in there. Don't have to go crazy. Just want enough to get it to stick. Yeah, I think that one just went in. Both feel pretty good. That one looks good. So we'll do the intake next. Bit of assembly lube. Too much. That's probably way too much. But a little extra is not going to hurt it. Perfect. So it's been just over a week and 
I've got all the parts I need. We have a new connecting rod, new piston, new set of rings, and also a new head gasket and sump gasket. So I think I'm ready to put this thing back together. And I was doing a few checks on the rings. I wanted to make sure the end gaps were good. And for the most part, they are. On the oil control rings, we were right at 16 thousandths of an inch, which is fine. You know, 30 thousandths is the reject size, so no issues there. On ring number two, which is indicated by these two dots, we also had 16 thousandths of end gap, so no issues there. And then we get to this ring. This, I assume, is the number one ring, but when I look on the side, I see no indication of that. There should be a paint mark. You know, that's what I always see. And that's what the included instructions say as well. There should be one mark right there. And I'm not seeing it. So that mark tells you which way to install the ring. And there are other ways you can tell. You just got to get a magnifying glass and look at it really closely. Uh, but that is how Briggs marks their rings. So once a ring is used that gets worn off and that mark is gone. So I guess what I'm wondering is why is the mark gone? Has this ring been used? And I'm kind of thinking it has been because if you look at the thickness of the ring, this is the number one ring that I pulled out of the engine. This is the one that's supposed to be brand new. And you can tell this one is thinner. We're at three millimeters on the supposed new ring. And this ring, we're at 3.6. So yeah, something doesn't quite add up here. So I'm gonna give this one a little bit of thought as far as which ring to use. You know, I did double check the end gap on this. And even though it's a used ring, it actually measures up pretty well. You know, I checked with the feeler gauge, eight thousandths is the minimum size, and it fits in there without issue. Here is the eight, no problem. And here's the 16, which is the upper end of the standard size. And that does not fit. So yeah, this ring, I mean, it wouldn't be my first choice but I think given what I got, it might be the better choice. So let me give it some thought. I also need to look at it closely and try to figure out which way is up. And yeah, got to make a decision here. So I've got you zoomed in quite a bit looking at this used number one ring. And you can see this side looks pretty flat. There is no bevel. So let me flip it over. And yeah, if you look on the top, that is where the bevel is. So on a compression ring, you want that bevel to be up. So I'm gonna mark that with a dot, indicating that that should be up. Just wiping all the oil off this crankshaft because I want to check the clearance between the new connecting rod and this journal on the crankshaft. If we had two new parts, the standard clearance would be one and a half thousandths. Now, based on the measurements I took, I'm actually expecting the clearance between the new connecting rod and this journal to be about 2.9 thousandths. And yeah, that sounds like a lot, but when you consider the reject size is two thousandths on the crank and a thousandth on the connecting rod, and the standard clearance is one and a half, then when you add it all together, the reject size of those parts combined is four and a half thousandths, which I think will be well below. So I'm going to use some plastic gauge. This is the red. It'll measure clearances between two and six thousandths of an inch, and basically you just break off a piece or cut off a piece, put it in the journal, and then tighten the new connecting rod down, torque it to spec, and when you then remove the cap, the plastic gauge is smushed, and the more it's smushed, 
the wider it is. So that means the clearance is tighter. You know, on this side of the scale, we're at two thousands clearance. And on that side, we're at six. So yeah, let's cut a piece of this off. We'll torque it down and see what the actual clearance is. I'm going to put this on exactly the way it's supposed to be. So one side's labeled PTO. That'll face like that. The other side is labeled mag for magneto, which is the flywheel side. It's a lot better than I thought it was. The widest line here, that's 2,000s of clearance. And we're pretty close to that. You know, if I go over to the next mark, that's 3,000s of clearance. And I would say we're definitely not 3,000s. It's closer to two. So, yeah. I think we're going to be good using this crankshaft. So it's decision time and we have to make a decision. And to be honest, I've already made the decision. I'm going to move forward. You know, is that the smartest choice? Maybe not. You know, I paid for a new piston and new rings. And that's what it looks like I got, except the new number one ring. Something doesn't add up. So I don't want to roll the dice and try that. I know this ring measures up well. And once I broke this engine free, we had good compression. So I'm not too worried about this ring. Really, the issue was the old number two ring. The end gap was too large. And this one we are not going to use. So I am going to move forward. We'll get this engine back together. Once it is, I'll double check the compression. Just make sure we're good there. And then we'll get it installed and try it out. So I'm going to start by installing the new connecting rod. I've got some assembly lube on the pin, as well as this journal. And just take note which way the arrow is pointing. That points toward the flywheel or the magneto. So you want to face the connecting rod in the direction of the arrow where it says mag. We just slowly push that in. Don't force it. There we go. And then we need to get the circ clip in without losing it. There we go. You want to take a close look at that. Make sure that clips in the groove all the way around, or it could fall out, and that would trash the engine pretty quick. In this case, I think we're good. Briggs does not have any recommendation on how to clock this. I think the big thing they highlight here is to make sure this expander doesn't overlap with itself. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to put the control rings in as well in a similar position, maybe 5 or 10 degrees offset on either side. And then I'm going to put ring 2, end gap over here, 
ring one and gap over there. So they'll be 180 degrees out. I mean, there's no saying it's going to stay that way once the engine's running. You know, in some engines, they actually have little, like, locators. So when you put the ring in, especially on two strokes, that ring cannot rotate. And the number two ring has the two paint marks. They go to the right in this orientation. So I'm gonna carefully get this ring installed. The top two rings are a lot less forgiving, so you don't wanna go crazy and stretch it too much. That's good. And then the number one ring with the paint mark facing up. There we go. So I want to get a lot of oil in the ring gaps, under the rings, as well as the sidewalls. And same thing for the tool that I'm going to use to compress the rings to install them. You want to make sure that is nice and oiled so you don't cause any damage. And don't forget the oil dipper or else the engine's going to blow up pretty quick. There we go. Just putting a bit of assembly lube on that paddle. That is what connects to the governor arm on top of the engine, and that's what slows the engine down. The governor on this engine, it's on the back of the crankcase cover, and that right there is what pushes on that paddle. So we'll get some lube on there. Uh, this gear 
meshes with that one. And this also drives the camshaft, which has that timing mark right there. So let's get the lifters back in. And these already have some oil on them. I did not clean them off, but we'll just add a little bit more just to make sure. Helps it stick in place. So just take note, that is the timing mark right there between those two teeth. And we're gonna to have to rotate this a little bit to get it to line up. That looks good. These bolts, they were secured with Loctite. So I already cleaned out the threads, just using a bit of blue Loctite to lock them in. Service manual says 100 inch pounds. Check chart says 200. I usually go up to 200. So actually, we'll start at 140. And then we'll finish it off at 200. Gonna get some oil in this engine. This is the part of the build where I start to get excited. And yeah, I wanna make sure I get oil in here as soon as possible. Don't wanna do something stupid, like try to start it without any oil in it, cause God knows it's gonna keep running until it blows again.
Gonna rotate the engine, make sure everything moves the way it should. So the exhaust is now closing. Now we're on the intake stroke. Intake is closed. Now we're on the compression. And the piston's at the top, just a touch past. So we're at top dead center, the compression stroke. And I'd say there's a little bit of clearance on these valves, but they do feel tight. Uh, these should be set to five thousandths of an inch, plus or minus a thousandth. So let's get the feeler gauge out and see where they're at. All right, let's check on the small side, which is four thousandths of an inch. That actually fits fine. Five fits with some drag. And the six does not fit. So the intake's actually perfect. Let's check the exhaust. And the 4000s does not fit. So let's loosen that one up. So we just put the 5000s in there, turn it until it's snug. That's a little bit too much. Try that. It might be a little snug, but it's always hard to tell because when you tighten this up, it always does move things a bit. So let's see a five. Yeah, still. Well, actually, it feels pretty good. And a six does not fit. Actually, it fits, but it's quite tight. So I think I'm going to leave it like that. I prefer to have the intake a little bit on the high side of the spec. So I'm just going to rotate the engine at least once here. We'll double check the valves. Okay. Intake is a snug five and a loose four. The exhaust, actually it feels like a loose five and a pretty snug six. So I'm happy with that. That should run fine. I scared myself there for a second. Went to put the valve cover on and realized I don't have a gasket. I ripped it when taking this cover off and actually threw it away. I had meant to order a new one when ordering the parts for this machine, yet I completely forgot. So I was considering using RTV. Luckily, I do have a couple of these 10 horse Briggs heads in a bin. And this one has the gasket we need. So yeah, no need for RTV. We can use this and continue on.
So I want to do a compression test. Obviously, I need to put the blower housing on with the starter recoil before I can do that. So we'll get the ignition coil on, we'll get the blower housing on, and I actually think I'm going to put the power head on as well. So that way the engine is fully secured and then we'll do the compression test. Anyway, before I get the coil on, you know, I do want to get the rust, at least the high spots off the magnet. You know, the rust isn't going to cause an issue with spark. But if the rust is too high, then when you go to set the gap, that rust will throw the gap off and potentially cause issues with spark. The gap on this coil should be 10 thousandths of an inch. Business card is pretty much the exact gap you need. So once the magnet's underneath it, just loosen the bolts, let the magnet pull the coil, and then just snug this up. These don't have to be super tight. and then rotate the engine at least once. Make sure the coil isn't hitting the flywheel. And in this case, we're good. Just gonna use a bit of scotch bright to clean up these slip rings. Got a breaker bar on the flywheel nut holding the crankshaft still. So let's torque down on that rotor bolt to 18 foot pounds.
So before I go too much further, I think it's a good time to just pull the engine over. The spark plug is still out, and what I want to see is that the engine turns over freely, that the rotor is not binding on the stator, and that I don't hear any scraping down there in the power head. Sounds good. All right, let's give this a try. There is a compression release on this engine. Usually I get about 60 PSI, plus or minus about 10. So let's see where this one comes in at. We're already at 60. And it looks like we're at 70. So, yeah, this thing should run. Carb's a little bit dirty on the outside, so I'm just gonna spray it down before I open it. And I'm hoping to get away with not putting this one through the ultrasonic. I know the carb was running when the engine ran out of gas. I think the big wild card here is how well and how long ago was that. And it's best to do this when the carb is still closed because these Nickies have a pretty big rubber gasket and you don't want to get carb spray on that because it'll swell and if it does that the carb definitely will not run right Looks very, very clean in here. So you know what? I'm not going to take this one apart. I'm just going to poke through the main jet. I can see these other passages are clear. I think this carb's going to run fine. Yeah, main jet's clear. This carb is going to run the engine well, I think. The filter that came on the machine is actually pretty clean, so I'm just going to reuse it.
So we're in the home stretch here. There's really not too much to do because I never actually disconnected these wires. So it's just a matter of resecuring this wire block, getting the brushes and AVR reinstalled. I think we'll be ready to give this a try. So for the brushes, there are two holes here, but there's only one bolt hole. The other side is just a pin that kind of holds that in place. At least on the Honda clones. A lot of other models actually use a bolt on each side. And for the AVR, the positive wire goes on the left brush. It's usually red, but not always, and sometimes labeled. And for testing, I'm gonna leave this top cover off. That's usually where the off switch goes. And the reason for that is because you can adjust the engine speed with that cover off. Once it's on, yeah, not so easy. So we'll test like this and finish it up later. I think we're pretty much ready to go. And it is threatening to rain out, so I'm gonna make this quick. I have the external fuel supply hooked up and 6,000 watts of load on standby. Now this generator is only rated at 5,500 watts. So we're not gonna put the full 6,000 on, not to mention we have a freshly honed cylinder, a new piston and rings. So the engine does need to be broken in. So it's not gonna be an extended test. Uh, the plan is just to get the engine going, let it warm up, We'll bring it up to 3,000 watts, double check the output. And if things are going well, I will bring it close to the max of 5,000 watts just for a few seconds. I want to keep it there long enough to hear how the engine responds and just make sure we have enough horsepower. All right, so we had no output, and I think it's user error on my part. The circuit breaker is off. So I guess the question is, did it trip or did somebody shut it off? So let's get the engine restarted and find out which it is.
So the good news is we do have power. It was just the circuit breaker. Now the voltage was low. It was around 112 volts. Uh, luckily this AVR does have an adjustment. It has a potentiometer. Usually one turn gives you about two volts. Sometimes a lot more though. The potentiometer can get dirty and you know, if you just move it a little and then set it back, you know, sometimes the voltage will come right up. So right there, I didn't actually change its final position and potentially it might be 120 volts now, but let's, let's just turn it one full turn clockwise. See what that gets us. So one turn did bring us up two volts. So we're at 114. So we need three more turns to get to 120. So there's one, two, three. So that should be 120. My personal preference is to have it a little bit over, like between 120 and 125. So I gave it one extra turn. And I'm thinking that'll get us close to 122 volts. Well, I'd say that was a pretty good test. I mean, it starts consistently, the first pull. The engine sounds good. And now that we made the adjustment to the voltage, that's good as well. Without a load, we're at 123 volts, 62 hertz. Under 3,000 watts, the voltage held steady, and the engine speed was exactly at 60 hertz. I then bumped it up to 5,000 watts, and the engine had no issues pulling that load. So we are not down on power. So I would say, mechanically and electrically, we are at 100%. All we need to do is finish it up. So let's get the end cap on the generator. We get the heat shield and the tank installed and call this one done. I think the bigger question here is, can we do this before we get rain done? At least all the clouds are making it a lot better for taking videos. Just making sure these are snug. And we do need a new zip tie for this right here. I cut this off. That is pretty important so the wires don't get sucked in around the rotor. So let's get this bolt out.
think we might be out of time. Just got hit with a raindrop. Who knows? We might get lucky. Well, thankfully the rain held off and I was able to get this machine fully back together. So this is ready to go back to Jason. And when I started this video, you know, I was thinking we would do a double feature. Just do two quick engine swaps on storm responders with blown engines. And as soon as I got this one apart and saw how good it was for a blown up engine, I really couldn't pass up the opportunity to bring this one back to life. So as a result, this has been a pretty long video. We've got one fixed machine, and we have another, which belongs to a local subscriber, that, well, still needs repair. So that is gonna be a story for a different day. You know, for now, I think I'm done. So, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.